Dr. Joe Taylor coming to speak to us, along with our excellent line of speakers for the, throughout the day. Uh, Joe was born in Philadelphia and grew up in New Jersey. He received a BA in physics in 1963 and a PhD in astronomy at Harvard University in 1968. His thesis was on uh, lunar occultation. Uh, since then, he's worked in all aspects of polar astrophysics. In 1974, Russell Hulse and Dr. Taylor discovered their first pulsar in a binary system using the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. He and Hulse shared the Nobel Prize in 1993 for the discovery of this pulsar. Uh, he moved to Princeton University in 1980, where he was a distinguished professor in physics, and he also served as dean and faculty for a few years. He retired from Princeton in 2006. To his ham radio side of things, Joe first obtained a ham radio license as a teenager along with his brother. He's well known in ham radio for his weak signal communication work. He's currently K1JT, but he's held various call signs, including uh, Victor Kilo 2 Bravo Julia X ray. In 2010, he organized a, an expedition, which was highlighted in QST, to the Arecibo Radio Telescope, and they conducted moon bounce QSOs with hams around the world using phone, CW, and digital modes. He's developed communication protocols and has written many computer programs, including the ones we all use, like JC JC65, used for weak signal work during moon bounce, meteor scatter, and low signal to noise ratio pads. So we all know him very well, even from afar. So it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Taylor, K1JT. So thanks very much, Rick, and good morning, everybody. Is this uh, loud enough in the back? Yeah. We're, we're okay? Q5. Uh, <laughs> terrific. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I always enjoy uh, meeting other hams. Uh, I think the, the hobby that we share uh, keeps us all uh, excited. It keeps us young. Uh, it has a really wide variety of different ways of enjoying uh, the nature of electromagnetic radiation in the radio portion of the spectrum. And, uh, uh, you know, the ones that uh, have been most interesting to me may, may or may not be the ones that have been most interesting to you, but we all have uh, really special uh, things to be thankful for uh, in uh, what this hobby has, has brought to us, I think. It certainly uh, got me started into a, a, a life in science, which, uh, for which I've always been very grateful, and, and I've enjoyed uh, in some sense, giving back to ham radio in, in my later years, uh, some of that uh, enjoyment and um, the ability to, to share with others uh, things that I've brought to, uh, to the hobby from my own professional work earlier. As you just heard uh, in that brief introduction that Rick made, uh, uh, my work was in radio astronomy primarily, in fundamental physics, uh, exploring the, the nature of, uh, of, of nature's laws. Uh, the laws of physics uh, by uh, astrophysical approaches. And uh, it turns out that uh, the work that I was especially honored for and with a trip to Sweden uh, involved detecting very weak signals from distant pulsars in our galaxy, uh, uh, an another kind of weak signal communication, if you like. <laughs> and and uh, it, to some extent, it's bringing some of those ideas that, and, and things that I developed in that work uh, back into ham radio, which has uh, given rise to these uh, software programs that I know some of you use. So anyway, let's, uh, let's get on with it. Uh, what I um, wanted to do uh, during this, uh, this hour is to give you a little background on what goes on under the hood in these uh, software programs. How do they work? Why does it uh, uh, give us the ability to communicate uh, in some sense, below the noise, at least with very weak signals, maybe too weak to hear, uh, and yet uh, uh, allow us to, to uh, have ordinary ham type uh, communications with them. So, um, I just I, I approach this from a historical perspective here. Around about 2001, when I was, uh, I had finished a term as, as uh, dean of the faculty at my university, Princeton, I was returning to my department, the physics department, and I was going to teach for a few more years before retiring. But I had time then to also to spend uh, uh, on rekindling my interest in ham radio. I'd, I'd sort of put it on the shelf for uh, 35 years or so while I was doing primarily other things, science and raising a family and, and all those kinds of things. 
Um, I had kept my license current all those years, and I never lost my code proficiency. <laughs> uh, so, but I was very happy to, uh, to get back into it again around about uh, 2000. So I was uh, originally keen to, uh, to see what I could do with uh, some ideas that my brother and I had experimented with as teenagers. Uh, meteor scatter on, on six and two meters was a, was a, fun, uh, a pro, uh, fun thing to do. Uh, at the time we were, uh, even in the late 1950s, doing those things. And I wanted to uh, sort of bring modern techniques to that. Um, I was interested in doing moon bounce, which I'd always thought was an exciting aspect of ham radio that I read about but hadn't done before. Uh, and I was uh, very much, by that time, cognizant of the fact that there were going to be a bunch of trade-offs involved. And I was interested in sort of re-engineering this from a, from a, uh, from a blank slate uh, perspective. Um, so consider the possibilities when you have very weak signals. Well, you either need a lot of transmitter power uh, or you need to optimize the way you use the bandwidth that's available. Uh, you, we have now very stable uh, frequency sources, which is a big advantage in digging a weak signal out of the noise. But there is a limit to the frequency stability of, of uh, our uh, typical uh, ham transceivers. So we have to take that into account. Uh, I was interested in, in uh, making a communication system, at least on paper at first, uh, which would be capable of uh, carrying on a QSO with a distant station somewhere. Uh, but I was interested in making sure that these uh, contacts would take place within a few minutes. Uh, I was aware that you know, there are various ways in which you can integrate signals over many hours, perhaps even many days or a couple of weeks. There was a, a uh, uh, a time a few years ago when it was uh, let, uh, we, we, we all learned that uh, signals at 136 kilohertz had been copied across the Atlantic, but it took two weeks to copy the signal. <laughs> and that was not sort of what I was interested in. So clearly there were going to be a lot of choices uh, choosing the uh, coding scheme, the modulation scheme, that kind of thing. I was interested in just sort of seeing what the possibilities were, what the, uh, what the fundamental limitations might be. Um, and at this point, I didn't really know anything formally about uh, communication theory, but I was interested in, in learning it. And, you know, we have good, uh, as, uh, good engineering facilities at, at uh, my university, a good library, and I spent a lot of time in the library <laughs> beginning to dig these things out and, and to understand them properly. So what are the kinds of things that, as a design uh, engineer, uh, if you like, or, or fundamental physicist in my case, uh, what can you play with? You can play with the data rate how fast you, you uh, key the signal. You can play with uh, uh, limitations that you might place on the structure of messages which can be exchanged. You can play with uh, uh, compression of the data, uh, the same kinds of uh, compression that is used when you uh, store data on a CD-ROM or something like that. Uh, you can uh, engage in uh, error control coding so that the messages arrive with very low probability of there ever being an error. You can mess around with the modulation scheme and the bandwidth scheme. You can, uh, you're probably going to need some sort of synchronization method between the transmitter and the receiver. That's going to be something that uh, you have uh, ability to play with. So um, with those kinds of tools, uh, and uh, let's think about what are the things we're going to try to optimize. Uh, I wanted it to be possible to make at least minimal QSOs, where you exchange call signs and a signal report and and Roger and 73 and maybe a few other uh, bits of information, but I was not thinking about a rag chewing mode. So this was sort of minimal information, uh, enough to, to call it a QSO, to write it down in your logbook, to send the guy a card, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, for media scatter, that means that we're going to have to uh, have a fairly high data rate because the amount of time that you have with a signal above the noise level uh, uh, the, the, the time that the signal is reflected off the ionized meteor trail and gets to the other end of the, of the, uh, of the propagation path may be only a fraction of a second. So we're going to have to send information at the rate of maybe a few hundred characters per second so that in a tenth of a second you get ten characters, maybe enough for two call signs, that sort of thing. Um, and I wanted this to work down to right about the noise level, so say zero dB signal to noise ratio, where I'm measuring the signal to noise in a typical uh, two and a half kilohertz uh, single sideband receiver's uh, passband. Okay, that's going to be sort of the standard reference bandwidth. Um, 
for moon bounce, uh, the speed could be, uh, uh, the speed of, of transmission or, or keying of the information could be rather slower because, let's see, if we, uh, let's, let's agree that we're going to transmit and receive on one minute cycles. I transmit for a minute while you listen and you transmit for a minute while I listen. Then we're going to need something like 13 or 15 or so characters per minute of uh, information to be exchanged if we're just going to exchange uh, simple messages which have our call signs and, and a signal report and, and a roger maybe, that, that sort of thing. And in that case, I wanted to be sure that uh, I got the signal to noise ratio at which the system could work down to as low as possible so that you could do it with a reasonable setup. Uh, not a monster antenna, but an antenna that you could put on a roof and wouldn't look too different from a TV antenna, say. And of course, obviously, we have to do it within the amateur power limits. Uh, if we can do it with only a few hundred watts, well, so much the better. And it turns out that means for moon bounce, you're going to want to work down the signal to noise ratios of the order of minus 20 something in this scheme where the reference bandwidth is, is the single sideband transceiver's pass band, two and a half kilohertz or so. Um, how can you copy a signal below the noise? Well, it's not below the noise in the bandwidth in which you will detect it. And the software is going to apply filters to the data, which will filter it down to very, very narrow bandwidths, perhaps only a few hertz. And if the bandwidth is, is say, two and a half hertz, and the total reference bandwidth is two and a half kilohertz, that's a 30 dB difference in bandwidth. Power is per unit <coughs> bandwidth, so that the amount of noise in the two and a half hertz filter is only one, uh, it's 30 dB lower. So that means that uh, if the signal is at this uh, level, that's plus 6 dB in the detection filter. That means you can actually detect the signal and it's stronger than the noise and you can tell whether it's there or it's not there or it's at this frequency or it's at some other frequency. All those kinds of things are going to work out. Uh, it turned out, although it wasn't my primary goal uh, in uh, originally <laughs> conceiving the scheme, it turns out this, if this will work for moon bounce on 2 meters or on 70 centimeters or perhaps the higher microwave bands, then it also is going to work very well at, at uh, lower frequencies, perhaps the HF bands. And in those cases, it's going to work in such a way that because the signal to noise capability is so good, you can work the world with five watts and a compromise antenna with this sort of a scheme. And that's why uh, JT65 has become so popular on the HF bands. You can work the world with, uh, you know, even if you've got deed restrictions on your ability to put up an antenna, uh, with only a few watts and, a, and an antenna in the attic or whatever, you can uh, work the world with this kind of a scheme. So uh, WSJT is, what the, is the name that I gave to the first program that I designed and what, I, what it was supposed to mean was weak signal, K1JT, my initials. Um, so um, it's a computer program. It, it brings these new ideas on coding and modulation. Uh, they're new in a sense for ham radio. They were at the time. Uh, they were not things that were fundamental advances in communication techniques because uh, communication engineering uh, uh, schemes knew this uh, long before. Um, in ap applying these things to the ham radio uh, world, uh, it, you just need a standard uh, linear transceiver, a single sideband transceiver, that something which uh, at the input accepts audio information, voice or, or whatever else you put into the microphone jack or the data connector on the back and puts out an RF signal, which is basically that same thing translated up to a much higher frequency. And at the receiving end, you translate it back down to audio and, and perhaps then digitize it and stick it into the computer and let the computer do what it will. Uh, and that's where the software comes in. Uh, so you need a standard sound card on the, uh, on the computer. They all come built in with those things now. And you basically need to connect to the microphone in and the speaker out on the, on the uh, transceiver or equivalent uh, connections that uh, modern transceivers always have now for, because these modes are getting more and more popular. There are thousands of users of, these, uh, the, the, of this software and others like it these days um, around the world. Uh, there are more than a thousand such users on two meter moon bounce, I know, because I've worked 850 of them or something, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I know I haven't exhausted the, the pool yet. And there are quite a few other uh, users uh, on, on the higher uh, uh, VHF and UHF bands as well doing these things for, uh, for moon bounce. 
Now, on the HF bands, I really don't know uh, how many there are, but I, I know that something like uh, 3,000 or so are, are using my software and probably uh, uh, comparable numbers using various others packages which has come up in recent years which are using the same protocols, in fact, using some of our software. It's all open source software, by the way, which means that anybody can look at the actual code. You can compile it for yourself. I'll say a few more words about that in the, uh, before I finish. So um, originally, remember, that I was doing this with the VHF and UHF bands in mind, and uh, Meteor Scatter was the first uh, goal, and that is a mode called FSK441. The, the numbers give the, uh, the, the rate at which the information is keyed, 441 keying cycles per second, or 441 baud. It takes three of those cycles for one to, to convey one character, that mode is a character-by-character character transmission mode, uh, sending ordinary ASCII characters, numbers and letters. And uh, that means that the character rate is 441 divided by 3, or 147, about 150 characters per second. That means that in a tenth of a second, when you get a meteor reflection that doesn't last for about a tenth of a second, you can get something like 15 characters. And that was enough for the kinds of messages that we had in mind. There are a couple of other modes that have come along more recently that are particularly uh, optimized for use on the six meter band called ISCAD and JT6M. There's this mode called JT65, which was designed for uh, moon bounce, but which has become so very popular for uh, QRP DXing uh, on the HF bands. Uh, there's a mode called JT4. In these cases, the ones that have just a number after my initials, um, the number corresponds to the number of different tones that are uh, in the uh, frequency shift keying protocol. Uh, JT65 uses 65 tones, JT4 uses four and so forth. Um, so JT4 was made especially for microwave EME. It's used for uh, EME all the way up to 24 gigahertz uh, and it works well there. You can actually make moon bounce contacts with a one meter dish uh, with this mode. Uh, just something that you can set up in the backyard. Um, and I'll, I think I have a picture in, in the slides here of, of one such operation. JT9 is a new addition, uh, just uh, a couple years old now, uh, added to the program that also uh, people use widely for using JT65 uh, on the uh, high frequency bands. Um, JT9 is different from JT65 in that it uh, keys more slowly and uses only nine tones, uh, so the bandwidth that it occupies is much narrower. Uh, and uh, it turns out it's a little bit more sensitive, about 2 dB more sensitive. That's not terribly important on the HF bands, but it, it's nice that it's so narrow in frequency, and I'll show you some examples of how that makes a difference. Uh, many of you have probably played with the whisper mode. Uh, that was uh, the acronym there was supposed to mean weak signal propagation reporter, uh, and it's nice that it pronounces as, as the acronym whisper. Uh, we talk about whispering around the world. Uh, with only a watt or two, you can uh, basically uh, have your signal heard anywhere in the world uh, if the bands are open. And it's, it's a fun way of finding out when the bands are open and where they're open to and so forth. So uh, let's carry on. Let me, in fact, say a few things specifically about whisper. Um, it's a QRP sort of beacon-like mode. You don't make uh, two-way contacts with it, but you do transmit and listen. Uh, it's just that you don't hook up on a one-to-one -one basis with another station. Instead, you send a two-minute long sequence of, of data tones uh, spread over uh, a very narrow bandwidth. It turns out the total bandwidth of a whisper signal is about six hertz. Uh, and uh, we more or less arbitrarily picked a 200 hertz segment of each HF band from 160 meters up to 10 meters. Uh, and there actually are whisper bands now, even on the lower bands that they use a lot in Europe where they have this 472 kilohertz band, which we may get one day, but we haven't got yet, and so forth. Anyway, so the whisper signal uh, sends over those two minutes, sends a very simple message. A call sign, a grid locator, tells where you are on the earth, uh, and a power level expressed in decibels above one milliwatt. So the typical signal uh, message that I send on a whisper transmission is my call sign, my grid locator, FN20, and 37 dBm is my power, that's five watts. 
30 dBm would be one watt, and so forth. Um, okay, so uh, other whisper signals, uh, whisper uh, operators uh, may pick up that signal, and if they get it, uh, it will decode, it'll give that information. There's a lot of error code built into the system so that you never get a, a mistaken decode. If it decodes, it's, it's right, almost 100% certain. Uh, and if the receiving uh, computer is connected to the internet, if a certain box on the screen is ticked that says upload spots, uh, then when you decode a signal, it's, it's transmitted to a central location, a server actually maintained by Bruce Walker, W1BW, somewhere up in the Boston area. And uh, anybody else can then uh, interrogate that server and find out what signals are being received and so forth. And I'll show you some, some examples of that in a minute. Typically on an average day today, these days, there are 500 or 600 stations operating Whisper on various bands around the world. So uh, there's something like 200,000 spots every day where this station copies that station and one of the, so that you basically can, can tell where the bands are open and uh, where signals are propagating. Here's what a whisper uh, screen looks like when you're operating the mode. Uh, that, that screen comes up on your computer screen. The, uh, the, the graphical area here is a uh, sort of a waterfall plot, but instead of going downward like water falling, it goes from right to left. <laughs> so that uh, the whole thing moves this way very slowly. Each one of these vertical strips about this wide, and it, on a typical screen it's a half an inch wide or so, corresponds to two minutes. So the total uh, amount of time displayed here is about half an hour. Each one of these vertical strips is, is one of these two minute intervals. You start a transmission uh, when you're working Whisper on an even UT minute and every successive even minute uh, is another uh, transmission interval. The little green and orange stripes uh, horizontally are whisper signals, so each transmission starts at a certain time and stops two minutes later. Um, the vertical green lines are when I was transmitting, so the waterfall stops then, I'm transmitting. The system is randomized so that on a completely random basis, uh, if I'm whispering and you're whispering, Occasionally, we may both whisper at the same time, but uh, they, those get randomized. And if we both select, uh, you can s optionally select uh, what fraction of the time you will be transmitting. On this screen, you can tick one of these boxes, 10%, 20%, 25%, whatever. Typically, 20 or 25% is about right, so you transmit once in a 10-minute interval and you listen for the other eight minutes, something like that. So you'll hear most of the other stations that are on that are in a, uh, within a detectable range from you. Anyway, when signals are decoded, they're, they're shown down here with a frequency and a signal strength and, a, and, a, uh, and, what, and what the message was. And since I had ticked this little box here that says upload spots, those will be transmitted to the uh, WhisperNet location and they will eventually be plotted on a map that looks like that. And you can pull that up on your browser and uh, basically it shows <laughs> where all the whisper stations were active then and where the band is open and where it's not. And uh, you can interrogate the map in various ways. You can tell it to only show the signals that uh, are on a certain band. Okay, so uh, this is probably the 30 meter band and it's open to, to uh, Africa and Europe now, and, and, but it's not particularly open to South America apparently. Um, and um, you can tell it to only uh, show me the spots that involve a, either re transmission or reception of, from a particular station, maybe your own. So here I've, I've selected my own location here in New Jersey and you can see where, where my signal is being heard or where I'm copying other stations. And you can click on each one, on any one of these call signs and bring up a, uh, a little uh, summary. Uh, it says K1JT is currently hearing all these stations and, they, and being heard by all those stations. <laughs> So basically, you can see where your signal is, is, uh, is reaching. Um, just for fun, if you Google the phrase stellar whisper, you'll uh, pull up a, uh, a, a nice little uh, piece written by uh, someone whose call sign I, I don't have on the top of my head right now. But he, he wrote, he put together a package where you, you can, uh, with a whisper uh, receiver kit, you can order one for $49.95. 
Uh, he's got a, a, a lesson plan package in it so that if you're a teacher, you can uh, let the kids build it and put it together and, and operate it with a little antenna strung around the classroom and pick up signals. Uh, he's even got lesson plans for you. It's a lot of fun. And a, and a simple system uh, like that, and since the teacher already had a computer, it basically with this 4995 receiver that the kids can put together, uh, you've got a whisper station. And that, by the way, uh, calls attention to another aspect of whispering. Uh, you don't have to be a licensed ham to do it because you can do it receive only. You don't have to transmit. And if you just receive, you can uh, hear all these other signals that are doing the transmitting for you. Okay, let's go on and talk about some of the other protocols for making actual uh, uh, two-way communications. All of these uh, protocols, JT, 65, 9, and 4, uh, are for making two-way contacts with minimal information exchange. Call signs, signal reports, a little bit of chit-chat perhaps, like thanks Roger 73, you can say things like that, but not much more. In fact, the total length of a, of a, of a non-structured message, just a completely free text message, is 13 characters. <laughs> That's all you can send in a one-minute transmission. The transmissions are timed so that they start at the top of a minute, they last about 50 seconds. Uh, if you're on the receiving end, you know the other guy has sent his information at the end of about 50 seconds, then your receiver, your, your receiving computer goes into decode mode and it figures out what the message was. And then you, you can figure out what you're gonna send next. So you have a few seconds to, to uh, see what he sent and decide what you're gonna send back to, uh, to the other end of the contact. So the messages are compact, they're, they're structured. Um, uh, a standard message has your call sign, my call sign, and then some other piece of information, uh, a signal report, perhaps my locator, something like that. Um, the modulation scheme is multi-tone frequency shift keying. Again, these are the number of tones that, are, that that thing is separated up into. And typically the bandwidth is quite narrow, much narrower than a single sideband signal. Uh, in fact, maybe only a few hertz wide for JT9 and JT4, they're only 15 hertz wide in their lowest uh, bandwidth scheme. Uh, and you can copy signals in these modes something like 10 to 15 dB weaker than the limit that a best CW operator could copy Morse code. So that's well below the audible threshold. You can put the headphones on and if you're copying a very weak uh, JT65 signal, you may hear nothing at all, just noise. Uh, when the signal to noise ratio, as measured in the, in the software, gets up to around minus 15 or so dB on the scale that is used, uh, you, then you can just, just begin to hear it, somewhere around that scheme. Uh, as I already mentioned, there are a thousand or more users of this on doing moon bounce on two meters and higher frequencies, and there are many thousands of users at, uh, at HF. The basic QSO, uh, typically, whether it be moon bounce or on HF, goes something like this. Somebody calls CQ. In this case, it was a good friend of mine, uh, Alex, RU1AA, somewhere up in the northwest of Moscow. Uh, so I, I sent him his call, my call, my grid locator. That's the standard response. He comes back and says, okay, K1JT, you're minus 14. That's a pretty good signal report uh, for moon bounce, but uh, he's got a huge antenna, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, all right, I come back and say, okay, Rod, uh, you're, uh, you're minus seven. That's, that's an unusually strong signal for uh, off the moon, and that would be visi uh, audible. You could hear that in the headphones without much trouble. He says, Roger, I say, thanks, Alex, and he says, fine business, Joe, see you later. And so that's, that's basically the whole contact. These, these modes are clearly not for uh, ca casual conversation or rag chewing. Uh, they're just for exchanging the basics of a, of a ham contact. Uh, if you're chasing DXCC or worked all states or whatever, it's very handy. You just make the contact quickly, put it in the log, and, uh, and request a QSL card or whatever. So, Joe, in, yeah. in that exchange, that would be a seven minute? Yeah, that, that's right. Each one of those lines was one minute long. It took six or seven minutes, whatever. You can perhaps skip one of the lines because, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't have to send him 73. As soon as I've got his Roger, I know the contact is good. Uh, it, during a moon bounce contest, I would probably skip that and go on and call CQ again, whatever. Um, so 
the most recent uh, version of our software is called WSJT-X, uh, X for experimental or extended or whatever. Uh, it's what we're working on now anyway. We have a fairly large group of, uh, of other programmers now working on the project. Uh, there are a dozen or so of us that are making contributions, so uh, it's become a, a group effort. Um, the, uh, in, in this case, the, um, we were acknowledging the unexpected popularity of the JT65 mode uh, on the HF bands, and we were making the, the program sort of more user-friendly, uh, particularly for HF users. Um, and at, at roughly the same time, I was developing the, the, what was then a new mode, JT9, uh, that was optimized for use on the lower frequency bands. Uh, HF and even the MF bands all the way down into uh, below the broadcast band in, in cases where those uh, bands are available. It's something like 2 dB more sensitive than, uh, than JT65 uh, for reasons of bandwidth and so forth. Uh, those 2 dB don't mean a whole lot for HF use, but occasionally, uh, and uh, when it matters, it matters, that 2 dB will make the difference between making a contact and not. Uh, the uh, uh, the, if you look at the ability of the program to copy a weak signal uh, versus signal strength, it cuts off very sharply at, uh, at the low end, where, where it begins to deteriorate uh, for JT65, it's around minus 24 dB. For JT9, it's around minus 26 dB. That means at minus, at, at one dB weaker than that, you'll get very poor copy, and at two dB weaker than that, you won't get any copy at all. Uh, and by poor copy, I mean um, you will copy only one out of three or one out of four or something times. You don't get garbled copy. It never garbles the copy because there's a built-in error correcting codes that knows when you've received a message whether it's okay or not. And if it's not okay, it, dis it displays nothing. So you don't see partial copy. You, you basically get everything or nothing. Um, the, um, WSJTX works uh, very nicely um, for HF users because instead of decoding just one signal, uh, the, one that, the one that you're trying to work, which typically is the case at, uh, when you're doing moon bounce or something like that, you're, you've, uh, there's only one signal in your passband. But on HF bands, there may be a bunch of signals in the passband, a dozen or, or more, and it decodes them all. So it gives you a whole screen full of who's working who and who's calling CQ and so forth. You can then pick out one that you want to, want to uh, respond to. Uh, and it works together with some other software, which others have written, called JT Alert and PSK Reporter and so forth, so that uh, you can actually see what's happening worldwide uh, on, on these modes. And I'll show you some examples of that in a minute, in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, JT Alert is, is a keen program which uh, basically tells you, uh, uh, it, it, it beeps at you if there's a new DXCC uh, being decoded that you haven't worked yet, things like that. Uh, it calls your attention to uh, the fact that there might be something interesting going on. Here's what the uh, a, a part of the screen of WSJTX looks like when you're operating. Uh, I guess it was tuned to the 20 meter band here probably. I'm not sure, but anyway, on, on each of the HF bands now, uh, by convention, there is a small segment about two kilohertz wide, uh, which is used for JT65, and then right above that, there's another small section, actually a little bit narrower, typically one and a half kc wide or thereabouts, uh, where JT9 signals show up. Each one of these um, uh, areas about this wide is a JT65 signal. There's a bright line which is the synchronizing tone, the lowest of the 65 tones. And then on the right, you'll see a sprinkling of other tones which come and go, uh, conveying the information in the JT65 message. The total, pass, uh, total bandwidth of a JT65 signal is about this much, and you'll notice that these, these various different operators have spaced themselves by about that amount so that they don't overlap too often. <laughs> uh, they'll overlap sometimes. This, the software is, is, because of all the built-in error correction coding, uh, is pretty good at copying signals even when they overlap. It, it may very, very well copy both of them, uh, again, with no, with, no, uh, with no errors. The JT9 signals over here are these uh, very narrow bands. They're only 15 hertz wide. The, the bandwidths here are about 170 hertz. These are about 15 hertz. So they're, 
they're less than one tenth of the bandwidth, and they uh, they work very well as well. So you can you can get a lot more JT9 signals into this uh, little spectrum than you can JT65 signals. That was one of the perceived advantages. Um, the the program has various features which I won't actually dwell on much now. It, it highlights in green uh, anybody, anybody that's calling CQ so you can quickly see the stations that you might want to respond to. It highlights in red the signal, uh, any message that it in, uh, contains your own call sign so that you can tell if somebody's calling you uh, immediately. The, the, uh, the uh, part of the screen on the left here shows all of the activity in the displayed uh, bandwidth, and the one on the right uh, displays only the activity at the particular frequency that you're operating at, which is shown by these little tick marks up here. The green one is your receiver, the red one is your transmitter. So what's being displayed here are my transmissions in yellow and his transmissions to me in red. Basically, that was our QSO. So your QSO is taking place over here, and here's all the rest of the activity going on in the band, sort of like CW Skimmer running and telling you who else is on if you're running uh, CW. Okay, so uh, here are a few of the cooperating programs that work together with uh, WSJTX. Uh, I'm running here now the software from DX Lab Suite, uh, Commander to control the radio, DX Keeper is the log, uh, here's JT Alert up here, and here's the WSJTX. They all work together. They talk to each other uh, through the computer, and, and they're, uh, they're cooperative programs, if you like. They've become quite popular. Here's PSK Reporter. I'm sure a bunch of you are, are familiar with that. It's, it's sort of like WhisperNet, except in this case, it's, it's uh, just using ordinary ham communications as the, uh, as the signals rather than using a, a signal explicitly put there for propagation testing like Whisper does. So you can basically see all the activity worldwide. I've selected here all bands, which is probably uh, is why it makes it such a jumble. The different colors indicate different frequencies. So here you can see that the Europeans are working South Americans on 10 meters. That's the pink color. The Americans are basically working both into Europe and into the Far East on 20 meters. That's yellow. And 15 meters, uh, that's kind of brown. That's open to Europe for us and also open to South America. There's also some 10 meter stuff going back and forth between North and South America. In the uh, in night time over here, the uh, Japanese are working into Europe still on 20 meters. <laughs> anyway, you can see what, what bands are open and it's a lot of fun. So um, you, again, with this thing, you can say that you want to see only the signals involving a particular call sign or only a particular band, whatever. Uh, you can, for example, put your own call sign in, call CQ, and see uh, how many places your, your signal is decoded. It'll probably be decoded all over the world. Um, <coughs> JT Alert, very clever program by uh, uh, Laurie, VK3AMA. Uh, it gives you both audio and visual alerts on the computer uh, keyed to uh, a particular call sign you might be looking for a particular grid locator you might be looking for, a particular DXCC or a zone or a state, whatever. Uh, it does automatic logging for you. It, it uh, looks up calls in the, in the uh, database if you need to have an address or something. Uh, and it talks back and forth to uh, the DX lab uh, logbook or, or uh, uh, the, the radio control software. And there are various keyboard macros that help you. Uh, to send uh, JT65 messages and so forth. So that's a handy program to use together with it. I mentioned that, the, that uh, JT9 has a few advantages over JT65. There's this 2 dB extra margin of sensitivity. Um, it, it works at a much lower bandwidth, so you can get a lot more signals into a very small piece of the band. The, uh, the parts of the HF bands, by the way, which have been conventionally used by operators with these modes, are very small slices, just a couple of kilohertz of, of each band. So we're getting a lot of, uh, a, a lot of good two-way communication uh, around the world uh, in very small slices of spectrum. Uh, and I don't think uh, other things here are need particular uh, calling out. Let me say just a few words about uh, moon bounce because uh, that was one of the original drivers for all of this. So that's my antenna at home uh, <laughs> pointing up. Uh, 
So f four Yagis on, on, uh, on two meters. Uh, they're each 30 feet long. It's a fairly big antenna. It's on a, on a telescoping tower so that when I put it down, you see I've got tall trees all around me. Uh, you don't notice it much. <laughs> Tell that to the neighbors. <laughs> but when it's up in the air, it's, it looks pretty big. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. Here's one that I built more, even more recently. It's, it's on the roof of the physics building at Princeton University. That's the call sign of our, of our university ham club. Um, and uh, we put together a, a, a EME capable station on the 70 centimeter band, 432 megahertz. So these, these are four Yagis, uh, elevation and azimuth control, uh, and I'll say a few more, more words about them in a minute. Uh, that's what they look like anyway. Here's a close up of these Yagis. They are cross polarized, right? Both polarizations. They got horizontal elements and vertical elements on the same boom. Uh, Folded, in, folded driven elements, a reflector, a bunch of directors. They're about 12 feet long. They're quite small, actually. Um, but they're moon bounce capable. And, uh, and they work very nicely. Here's the scheme that uh, the software uh, uses. So we've got both horizontal and vertical uh, elements on the, on the antenna. When I transmit, we'll transmit on either one or the other, either horizontal or vertical. But on receiving, we use both. Why is this? Because incoming moon bounce signals will have an arbitrary linear polarization depending upon the amount of Faraday rotation in the upper, uh, in the atmosphere, in the ionosphere. Uh, signals coming through the ionized uh, region of the Earth's atmosphere that have magnetic field in them which is basically all of it, means the angles get rotated as they, as they move through. And that means that although you may think you transmitted horizontal and the guy in Europe that you're trying to work is also transmitting horizontal, the received signals at both ends may be anything. And it'll change with time of day and, and they're unpredictable. So we have two receivers, a horizontal receiver and a vertical receiver. We convert down to baseband uh, we have software uh, at that point which takes both signals. Uh, the conversions that go from radio frequency, uh, 432 megahertz in this case, down to baseband, uh, zero frequency essentially, are uh, the, the, the oscillators in the two different uh, channels are coherent. They're the same oscillator split through a splitter that goes to both things. So that the baseband signals can then be combined. We can combine the X signal and the Y signal uh, and if you combine them equally, you get a 45 degree polarization. If you subtract them, you get the other 45 degrees. And if you take 90% uh, of one and 10% of the other, you get other angles. Basically, you can form any angle you like. So the incoming signal can be, uh, we can measure, basically measure its polarization. And the software does that automatically. And it sort of peaks up uh, as, as though you had rotatable polarization. It will, by software, do that. And then it'll display the, uh, the sig signals as received, having separately peaked up on each one polarization-wise. And then it will decode the JT65 codes and display them all on a screen. And uh, uh, here's, well, there's the waterfall spectrum shown when uh, uh, the station at, at the university on 432 megahertz is receiving. I think this was during an EME contest, so there was a fair bit of activity on. Here's a finished station. Here's one that uh, I didn't decode, but I can see that he's there. There's some little blips there. Uh, LZ1DX K5QE, right, not too far from here in Nagadolches. <laughs> and uh, and uh, K5DOG, actually, I think he, uh, he operates, uh, maybe somebody here knows. I, I'm pretty sure he operates remotely. I think his station is in New Mexico, but he lives in Texas. He's, he's okay, he's, he's, he's changed now. Anyway, uh, these things work very nicely. Uh, there's, uh, I forget, oh, here we are, by the way, uh, this is another program uh, which has the capabilities of, of uh, like doing a cell phone selfie. You can, you know, use the, uh, use the moon as the reflector and check your own signal. You basically send a signal, receive it two and a half seconds later and display it here. So the, the nice red curve is, is the uh, spectrum of the signal that we transmitted from W2PU reflected back from the moon, measure its signal strength that was minus 19 dB at that time. Uh, a nice sort of system check 
Uh, we can also measure the polarization of what's coming back, and that'll tell me how much Faraday rotation I got on the way out and the way back. I may have transmitted in one polarization, I'm receiving a very different one. That's a nice uh, system test. I mentioned that uh, one of the modes, JT4, is being widely used now for microwave uh, moon bounce. There's a guy in, uh, in Tasmania, VK7MO, Rex Moncur, good friend that I've met a couple of times. Rex likes to do uh, grid expeditions where he'll put stuff in his car and drive all over Australia. And uh, he takes with him a one meter dish. Actually, I think this is a two foot dish, so it's less than a meter, it's about this big. Uh, tripod, and he can work uh, other stations worldwide by moon bounce uh, on the 10 gigahertz band with about, uh, I think he has 20 watts. Uh, so JT4 is very sensitive for that sort of thing, and, and he can set it up arbitrarily anywhere in the, in the Australian outback uh, and, and make moon bounce contacts. So just, I, I'll s start summing up at, uh, at this point and uh, leave a little time for questions. Um, just to um, emphasize again, uh, the goal here was to be able to make uh, basic, minimal ham contacts uh, at very weak signal levels, whether that be weak because we're going all the way to the moon and back, or reflecting off a meteor trail, or using only a few watts uh, and, a pa and a poor antenna, say, on the HF bands. Any of those things will guarantee that we've got weak signals, but we want to communicate anyway, so what do we do? Well, with single sideband, uh, you need a positive signal to noise ratio. Uh, even at, uh, say, plus 3 dB or so, that means you can just about hear the guy. You might be able to copy it, especially if you more or less know what he's going to be saying, uh, like, you know, call sign and so forth. But uh, that's not comfortable copy. That's just barely able to be copied. With FSK441, you get down to just a little bit below the noise level in, in, uh, in the way we're measuring things here. Remember, the reference bandwidth is the full two and a half kilohertz. With CW and a narrow filter, or using the narrow filter of your own ears, which is typically good down to maybe 100 hertz or so, a really good, uh, well-trained CW operator might have the equivalent of more like a 50 hertz filter. Uh, and you know, that's, that's sort of what the typical bandwidth is. You can get down to something like minus 15 dB on this scale and still copy a very, very weak signal, uh, uh, CW signal at that level. With iSCAT, you can get a little bit lower yet. With JT4, you get down to something like into the minus 20s and, and progressively JT65, JT9, and Whisper are better yet. Whisper, by the way, does the best of all, but remember that's not for communicating. Uh, two-way con uh, conversations, and furthermore, the transmissions are twice as long, two minutes instead of one minute. That picks up 3 dB right there, so uh, it's not surprising that it, it comes out at the very bottom of the scale. But these things are mean that uh, the fact that these are down into the minus 20 range means that uh, you can make contacts with very poor conditions or very marginal uh, equipment that would not be capable of, of making communication using uh, Morse code or, or single sideband voice. I mentioned that the, uh, all of the development of this software is, is pretty well documented and is available online. Uh, if you Google my call sign, you'll, you'll come up with this, this uh, address. And um, anybody can download the software, can, can play with it, can modify it. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, you might be interested to know that the graphical user interfaces, the, 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 the screens that have the buttons and the displays and so forth, are written either in a language called Python or in C++ with a, with a package known as Qt, Qt, uh, which sort of has the, has the buttons and things defined in it. Python is a very elegant, uh, uh, fairly re modern language uh, for computer programming uh, that um, makes it easy to design the interfaces and so forth. The actual number crunching, the calculations, are done in the ancient but honorable language of Fortran. <laughs> Ma mainly, be mainly because that I can write that in my sleep and <laughs> I'm good at it. But uh, anyway, uh, it, it's, it's the most efficient uh, number crunching language there is and it has, has large libraries available that, that do special purpose functions and so forth. And some of the stuff that uh, we used for uh, for discovering and, and measuring pulsars uh, in, in my research work 
uh, had software that basically got translated into HEM terms to be used here. Uh, we use subversion for version control. That means that we can keep track of all the previous versions of a program, uh, and uh, anybody else can as well. And uh, again, to anybody here who's inclined in those directions, if you're uh, interested, uh, co contributors are welcome, and we uh, we have a, a very active group now that with an email reflector that uh, sort of where we decide on where we're going next if we do continue. So uh, I think that's a good place to stop. I thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to be very happy to answer some questions if you like. Yes, sir. Yeah. And the input track to the uh, computer is 2.5 millimeter, which means if you go over there and buy a 2.5, 2.5 cable, go home, you're on receipt. Yeah. You're on receipt. Yep. Okay? Yep. Um, the other thing, uh, I don't know if anybody, I would like the cursor a lot bigger on uh, which direction. Uh, is there a program we're working on? Uh, you, you, which, what cursor do you mean? The one that's on the frequency well, it's scale? It's like a little gun sight now. It's like this, yeah. it's like this big. Yeah. I, I'd like it to go all the way up and down <laughs> so that I can analyze signals better. Okay. okay. Good suggestion. Um, I think that maybe uh, a different version of your Whisper X could be used by uh, emergency communications uh, people to know 24 hours a day, Metro Bay would know exactly what all of the signals are. He, all he'd have to do is look at his screen. Fair enough. Oh, well, I mean, I... But uh, also, I would like him to modify the software so it doesn't report to uh, wherever it reports to <laughs> now, uh, so whispernet.org. Well, as I say, I mean, su suggestions are always welcome, and right. we, we have email reflectors for receiving them, and I hope and you'll uh, contribute and those. And Yeah. Uh, he knows where they are and what power they're running and sure, all Sure, right. We could take that, th those number of digits, and make a little table out of it that they could send maybe 200 and some odd unique messages to each other. Okay. Let me uh, just respond by saying uh, I would be pleased to, to receive any kinds of suggestions of that kind. Let's use the time right now for questions, if you will, and, and, uh, and we'll go ahead. Okay. Please. So, How you calculate? Oh, uh, yeah. The reference is to a f the fact that when the uh, when you're operating moon bounce, the program uh, decodes a message. It will give you a parameter called dt for difference in time. Dt is basically the amount by which the program had to adjust the uh, synchronization in the time direction to line up with the sync uh, that it expected to find in the received signal. So for two stations operating uh, on Earth, you would expect that difference in time to be close to zero if both operators have their computer clocks set correctly. And there are automatic ways of making sure that that normally is true. So you expect DT to come out close to zero. If it's a few seconds off, it means that probably it means that somebody's computer is a few seconds off. For moon bounce, the DT should come out around about two and a half seconds because that's the round trip travel time for the signal to the moon and back. And uh, so now that I've explained that, I need to ask you again what the question was. How do you calculate that? Oh, how do I calculate? Okay, the, 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 the signal has synchronizing information built into it, and the, received, uh, the, the receiving program knows that synchronizing information, knows where it should be, and it tries basically sliding a, a matching uh, template uh, against the signal to see if it can find the sync, uh, sync information. And it does that both, both in frequency, uh, frequency going this way and time going this way, if you like. So it, li it finds out how much the frequency is off and how much the time is off. Now, the frequency could be off by anything because our radios aren't calibrated down to the one hertz accuracy, typically. And furthermore, uh, for moon bounce, there's some Doppler shift involved. That's going to move it a bit. But the time should be basically two and a half seconds, and that's how it's calculated. Uh, no, uh, it, it's best to leave your transceiver set to its full 
single sideband bandwidth because the software does all the necessary filtering. And it, 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 uh, you'll confuse the software if you put a narrow filter, or say a, C, a narrow CW filter in front of it uh, so that only a small amount of the spectrum gets through. You want the whole two and a half kilohertz to come through. Yes, sir? Right. Does the radio need to have uh, like a TXCO module as a prerequisite? No, on the HF bands, typically transceivers are, are stable enough that you don't need super high stability oscillators. Uh, on, on a whisper screen, uh, you will occasionally, remember those little green markers, which were the signals, occasionally you see one that's sloped a little bit. Uh, he's got a, probably a, a soft rock or some, you know, something that he built. Uh, and it's not very stable. Uh, maybe after it warms up, the, the, the slope will go away and they'll get horizontal. <laughs> okay. Uh, so typically, uh, on the HF bands, the transceivers are stable enough that you don't need any extra uh, tweaking. Even those modes, JT65. Yeah, even in the narrow Especially modes. The narrow yeah, modes. right. Again, you'll occasionally see signals that obviously on the on the waterfall display drift a little bit, and the the program knows enough to. Uh, to search a little bit to see whether there's, it gets a better <coughs> decode if it, if it uh, tries a little slope on the, on the uh, frequency. Uh, so it's got a sort of automatic frequency control built into the software, but that has a limited range. If it drifts too much, you won't get a decode. Yeah? Now, how much computer is actually necessary to run this program? Uh, today, <coughs> Any computer you bought in the last five years should be good enough. I mean, I've, uh, no. Uh, compiling, you, you need a relatively, well, it either will take a long time or you need a machine with a lot of memory. But, uh, but running the programs, basically any, anything that you buy fairly recently. Don't try to run it on a Windows uh, 98 pro. <laughs> it probably. Right, yeah, yeah, good. Uh, two questions, uh, perhaps more, but I'll ask two to see if I can get them in. One is, was the, your antenna for EME was elevated on your mat? Yeah. Is that permissive versus having it at ground? Uh, only because I have tall trees all around me, okay. and the trees absorb. Second question is, uh, relative to uh, education. Yeah. I, I don't know of any books that uh, say anything much about Whisper. There's an ARRL book about digital HF work, which, which has a chapter on JT65. Uh, but I would, uh, for, for more information on Whisper, I would, I would use Google and, and, uh, and search, because there's a lot of stuff on the web, not all of which I'm even familiar with. But, uh, well, I don't think that's just with Whisper, but the whole digital. Yeah. yeah. OK, well, there's that, that, that ARRL book, I know. I was going to have to cut you off. One yeah, take OK. One more. One more question. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Okay, back here. Hey, uh, first, hey, your website pretty much explains a lot of that stuff. Yeah. As far as the instruction and all that. How often yeah, by, by the way, I should say the, we, we've put a fair amount of effort into the user guides for these programs, which have some information also on, on how the stuff works. So uh, I know nobody reads user manuals, <laughs> but, but, but read the blank, blank manual, will you? <laughs> No, it, it decodes within two or three seconds, typically. No, on JT65? Yeah, it should. So if I tune in at, 30, at, the, at the 30 second mark, I should be able to decode. Oh, no. It, uh, you, need to, you need to receive for most of the minute, or it, it's not going to decode at all. I mean, the receiver should be running continuously when you're not transmitting. And, and if, you, if you change the frequency or otherwise tune in, uh, 30 seconds after the start of a minute, you probably won't get a decode during that minute, but you will during the next minute. But, but the, the, cost, the, the exchange still goes off within a couple, a couple seconds. <laughs> the, 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 the information Let's talk a little bit more afterward. We'll try to straighten that out. 
Anyway, Thanks, Rick. At the Greater Houston Hamfest, we uh, thank you for coming. We welcome Joe from New Jersey. And, and because this year is the Texas State Convention for ARL, we have a special cup with Joe's call sign. Oh, cool. Very thank you good. very much, Rick. <laughs> okay.